My name is Dr. Harold Bays, Medical Director and President of the Louisville Metabolic and Atherosclerosis Research Center located in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I'm board certified in endocrinology and metabolism as well as obesity medicine. Uh, I'm also Chief Science Officer of the Obesity Medicine Association. I'm also Fellow of the American College of Cardiology. What I find is uh, there are a lot of clinicians uh, who very well understand the importance of treating obesity. But this is, but the treatment of obesity, the evaluation and the treatment of obesity is not something taught very much in training. So now you have uh, an entire group of, say, cardiologists that, uh, that really want to prioritize the obesity because of its uh, consequences of the diabetes and the hypertension and the dyslipidemia, uh, atherosclerosis and these types of things, uh, I think cardiologists know that that's a primary cause for the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that they see in clinical practice. So it's quite natural that a cardiologist would say, how can I manage this? And I think that would be the greatest unmet need. It would be from a very practical standpoint, how does a cardiologist uh, approach the patient with obesity. Currently, um, uh, some of the most effective strategies that we have towards assessing and managing the patient with obesity would be first, proper diagnosis. Uh, so you're gonna wanna look at uh, potential uh, primary and secondary causes, say for example, genetic disorders and such. The other, one, the other thing you wanna really focus upon is are there medications that are contrib contributing to weight gain? And what about like psychological issues that uh, may apply? For example, are there eating disorders? Are there problems at home? Is there depression? So there's a number of things that you're really gonna wanna evaluate when you see your patient with obesity. The other thing is you wanna get the diagnosis right. So many times body mass in index is fine, but for a lot of folks it's not. So we do a lot of uh, body composition at our research site. We use, um, uh, dual x-ray absorptiometry or DEXA scans, but other people use other sorts of um, assessments uh, for body composition. So once you've evaluated the patient, you've diagnosed the patient, uh, you've done the proper testing and such, then you're gonna wanna look for the complications, the particular complications of the obesity. And based upon all of that information, then you're gonna wanna embark upon a treatment strategy. And the treatment strategy is going to include nutrition. Now, I know a lot, of, a lot of cardiologists say, well, you know, I don't really have time for that. Well, there are simple things you can do. Like one, have your patient keep a dietary diary. Have them write down every single thing they eat and drink except for water. You can review that with the patient upon their next visit, right? So you can, they're doing all the work. You can review uh, what they uh, have written down. And a lot of times it really doesn't take a, a degree in nutrition to look at a, at a patient's dietary diary and make some practical changes and such. Alternatively, you can refer a patient to the dietitian, which in many cases might be the most cost effective. What about physical activity? Well, at the Obesity Medicine Association, uh, we have guidelines, physical activity guidelines, similar to, to other people where you wanna strive to get, you know, 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week or more if you can and such. But, but we add another potential metric, and that is do at least 5,000 steps per day. At least 5,000 steps per day. And people say, oh, well, has that got to be dedicated you know, to exercise, or can it be just walking around? We don't care. If a patient has the obesity, and if the patient is, is sedentary, or, you know, or has physical inactivity, then what matters most is that we pick up that physical activity and steps is a really nice way to do that. And people get so enthusiastic if they have their wearable technologies and can count their steps. And if they see that they're succeeding by getting over 5,000 steps per day, which is doable for a lot of patients, that's a really good place to start. It's not a place to end, but it's a good place to start. And then uh, there's always consideration for bariatric surgery and such, but <clears throat> what's really exciting now, particularly within the realm of cardiology are all these anti-obesity drugs that are in development. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I've been doing clinical research for over 30 years and 
I've been a principal investigator somewhere, somewhere around 500 to 600 clinical trials. And in my early years, we focused on diabetes and hypertension and dyslipidemia and their cardiovascular uh, effects and such, and how these medications affected cardiovascular outcomes. And that's exactly what we're doing now with the anti-obesity medications that are out there. Very exciting. Where we stand right now is we have uh, uh, several medications that are approved for treatment of the diabetes that have proven cardiovascular outcomes benefits due to uh, the data that we've collected from cardiovascular disease outcomes trials. So for the people out there, it's, say they're into evidence-based medicine, we have that information for many of these drugs when treating the diabetes mellitus. So there's clearly, say for example, just give you one example, glucagon-1 uh, receptor agonist, right? Glucagon-1 peptide receptor agonist. Uh, many of these drugs not only improve glucose levels, but they reduce cardiovascular disease events. <clears throat> Some of these drugs at the higher doses are also um, being evaluated now in cardiovascular disease outcomes trials. Now, we don't have the results of those trials, right? We don't have the results of those yet. But my prediction is, as we sit here today, my prediction is that we're gonna find within the next year, and certainly within the next five years, uh, several drugs that are not only going to be highly effective in uh, improving the weight of patients, but also effective in reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so just like back in the day when people were reluctant to use some of the newer diabetes medicines or blood pressure medicines or lipid medications, you know, well, we don't really know if it really helps people. That's what people said, right? What was the the switch. What was the switch, the on-off switch that caused people to say, wow, I'm not sure I should use it, but now it's standards of care. What was the difference? And if people think about it, the difference was uh, that they showed cardiovascular disease benefits from, from randomized prospective uh, cardiovascular outcomes trials. That's exactly where we are now with obesity. Where we are with obesity today is exactly where we were 20, 30 years ago when I was working with the, again, with the diabetes and the hypertension and, and the lipid drugs and such. That's where we are today. It's very exciting. We have these uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists. I mentioned that. Uh, we also have GLP-1 agonists that are combined, okay, with what we call GIP or glucose-dependent insulin, insulinotropic uh, peptide. Um, you know, we have that agent that's out there uh, undergoing cardiovascular outcome studies. And then there's other ones that maybe a lot of cardiology people out there have not even heard of. I can just tell you as a clinical trialist, as somebody that just does this for a living, again, I'm an endocrinologist, uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a diplomate in obesity medicine, but what I mainly do are clinical trials. And it, as excited as I was, back in the day when we were developing these newer diabetes drugs and newer blood pressure drugs and newer lipid drugs and everything is exactly how I feel today about uh, these new novel uh, anti-obesity drugs. It's a very exciting time. The Obesity Medicine Association uh, has, the font, has this term. It's called highly effective anti-obesity medications. And, um, the how that's defined is that in a clinically meaningful percent of patients, there's at least a 15% reduction in body weight. Now, for some people, maybe that isn't as much as they think, but remember, this is an average, okay? This is an average. And the other thing I would remind people is it wasn't that long ago where the best we could do was maybe a 3 to 5% reduction in body weight. When you start talking about 15 20% reduction, okay? 15 to 20% reduction in body weight, that's profound. That's a new age. That's, that's, and that, well, I think we all know this. We, five years ago, uh, how, mu how, how much uh, news did you hear about anti-obesity medications? Not much. Now it's about all you hear about, isn't it? You hear about it all the time. It's because people, 
are genuinely excited by these drugs because we have data to support that they truly are different than what we've had in the past. So that, that's how I would define success from a weight reduction standpoint. I would also define success as to what degree do these novel agents that we're developing now reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. So that goes back to what I was saying before. Having a, a cardiovascular outcomes trial supporting a cardiovascular disease benefit is going to be, it's going to change the world. It's going it's, it, to it's gonna be a new age. It already is a new age. It already is a new age. And then you might say, well, you know, how does this stack up against bariatric surgery? And I would ask people to be cautious about comparing reported with bariatric surgery and the weight reduction reported with anti-obesity medications. So yes, bari bariatric surgery still, in many cases, has greater weight reduction than the anti-obesity medications. However, when you read the literature, be very, very careful. The way that the surgeons in bariatric surgery, uh, uh, the way that they report their weight reduction is by a very different calculation than the way that we report it within the context of clinical trials. So just, just be cautious uh, when you're reading the literature, because if you just if you just read it and didn't know that that there is differences in the metrics and differences in the calculations and differences in the math about how uh, the degree that there is uh, weight reduction with surgery and weight reduction with anti-obesity medications, you might think surgery is way better than some of the anti-obesity medications, but I will tell you that, that the anti-obesity medications, not quite there, but, but really starting to move up, uh, we're maybe ultimately, particularly if we're combining some of these drug treatments, we can really start approximating the kind of weight reduction that we have with uh, bariatric surgery. The only way that we can address the obesity epidemic and the only way that we can treat the individual with obesity is a patient-centered approach, right? Where you, you make recommendations based upon, uh, you know, that's culturally sensitive and something that the patient will agree to do and that the patient's ready for change. You know, all of these types of things, behavioral modifications, got to be part of it. Uh, so it's got to be patient-centered, but on the flip side, from the, from the clinician standpoint, it's got to be a team. It's got to be a team, right? It, it can't just be, <laughs> you know, I'm going to single-handedly stomp out obesity as we know it. That's never going to happen, right? So there has to be a team approach where you do have the primary clinician that's engaged, and you do have a dietitian that's engaged, and you have the, maybe the exercise physiology person that's engaged. Uh, and as we're talking here with regard to potential heart disease, that you have a cardiologist that's engaged, okay? The cardiologist, in many ways, you know, leading the way towards emphasizing the importance of uh, treatment of, uh, management and treatment of obesity from a cardiovascular disease standpoint. You gotta have it. The cardiologist has to be there. And then you would add on top of that, uh, look, second, only secondary to cigarette smoking, only secondary to cigarette smoking, Obesity is the second most common cause of cancer. So in many cases, you gotta have the oncologist involved. So again, if you, if you start adding all these things up, and then you could add gastroenterologists, you know, if there's gastroenterology complications and dermatology and everything, there's just so many complications from the obesity that again, the only way that obesity gets effectively treated is to a team approach, everybody working together, okay? And, and again, cardiology, in many cases, particularly in the patients who have, are at high risk, already have cardi cardiovascular disease, in many ways got to take the lead. Again, I'm an, in, I'm an endocrinologist, and yes, I'm aggressively treating, <clears throat> I'm aggressively treating the, the diabetes, and the hypertension, and dyslipidemia, and trying, to, trying to reduce those cardiovascular disease risk factors. But as much as I think I am impactful as a clinician, I think if you have a cardiologist that's managing a person's heart, managing a person's heart, and they've already had a heart attack or they have heart failure or whatever, 
I think having that message, that essential message of the importance of obesity treatment coming from the cardiologist, I think that's key. I think, I think it really matters. For all of you that maybe have been frustrated, our patients with obesity have been frustrated and clinicians who help manage them have been frustrated because I think there's a sense that the, that the treatments that we've had available have just not been sufficient to get to where everybody wants to be, right? Um, and that's nobody's fault. Sometimes it just takes time to develop these sorts of therapies and such. But, but we're getting there now. And so if I had to give the main takeaway message is, you know, please, when you see your patients with the obesity, think about all the new science that's out there now, okay, now. But also think about all this extraordinary science that's about ready to be revealed. And, and so again, instead of having that, that sense of frustration and defeatism, and like, I'm just not sure how effective I can be in managing my patients with obesity, just know this, the science is just around the corner, okay? And, and the science that I think is gonna make the biggest difference in taking, uh, you know, these medications from rarely being used to being standards of care, it's gonna be the cardiovascular disease outcome studies. And I, and I would just encourage the cardiologists to, to stay tuned, keep ears open, right? Pay attention, because it's gonna happen. And, and I, again, for many of the patients who have cardiovascular disease or are at high risk for cardiovascular disease, it's gonna really help if the cardiologists in there, you know, working with everybody else, to drive the point home that obesity is a disease, needs to be treated, and we have effective therapies.